Remember, one of the ways you can help support our show is by leaving us a review on iTunes. We appreciate you taking the time. Thanks. Patriotic hacktivists talk turkey to high-profile Twitter accounts. The hide-and-seek IoT botnet spreads swiftly through specially crafted peer-to-peer communications. Vulnerabilities are found in the Electron Developers Framework. ICOs are heavily targeted by criminals. Bell Canada was breached and the Mounties are on the case. Ontario transit operator Metrolinx is asked how it knows North Korea hacked it. British Prime Minister May takes a swing at secure messaging and tech companies generally. Fancy Bear doesn't like Olympic luge. And what's the significance of a values statement? Time to take a moment to tell you about our sponsor, Recorded Future. Recorded Future is the real-time threat intelligence company whose patented technology continuously analyzes the entire web, developing cyber intelligence that gives analysts unmatched insight into emerging threats. At the CyberWire, we subscribe to and profit from Recorded Future's Cyber Daily. As anyone in the industry will tell you, when analytical talent is as scarce as it is today, Every enterprise owes it to itself to look into any technology that makes your security teams more productive and your intelligence more comprehensive and timely. Because that's what you want. Actionable intelligence. So sign up for the Cyber Daily email, where every day you'll receive the top trending indicators recorded future captures crossing the web. Cyber news, targeted industries, threat actors, exploited vulnerabilities, malware, suspicious IP addresses, and much more. Subscribe today and stay a step or two ahead of the threat. Go to recordedfuture.com slash intel to subscribe for free threat intelligence updates. That's recordedfuture.com slash intel. And we thank Recorded Future for sponsoring our show. Major funding for the CyberWire podcast is provided by Silence. I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Thursday, January 25th, 2018. McAfee has continued to track the hacktivist Twitter compromise campaign of Ayildiz Tim. Their intentions have increasingly turned to the Twitter accounts of high-profile journalists. They continue to be interested in both tweets and direct messages. The content of their communications over the hijacked accounts generally aligns with the government of Turkey's positions, Thus, they would be a fair specimen of the patriotic hacktivist variety. A representative message of Ayildiz Tim would be, We will show you the power of the Turk, and we love Pakistan. The campaign has some social engineering dimensions to it, since direct messages have been used to induce people to follow malicious links. But the general operation is typically hacktivist. Ideological cries and defacements transpose to social media. Security company Bitdefender is describing a new Internet of Things botnet, Hide and Seek, or simply HNS. HNS is marked by its rapid spread, growing from 2,700 to more than 24,000 devices over the last two days. Its infection mechanism is the same as Reaper's, but researchers discern no other connection between the two botnets. HNS's rapid spread is enabled by a decentralized peer-to-peer mechanism that will complicate any takedowns. Other botnets have used P2P communications, but they've relied upon an existing BitTorrent protocol. HNS uses a custom system. Once installed, HNS's capabilities include code execution, data exfiltration, and interference with device operation. Effectively, every infected device serves as a command and control server, a file server, and a jumping-off point for further infection. Bitdefender thinks HNS has the hallmarks of an attack prepared by an unusually sophisticated threat actor. Widely used applications, including Skype and Slack, that were built using the popular developer platform Electron, are being patched after the Electron framework has been discovered vulnerable to remote code execution. While Electron is used to develop apps for macOS and Linux, this vulnerability affects only Windows applications. Initial coin offerings, ICOs, a trendy approach to funding that's attracted increased interest from legitimate businesses seeking to raise capital, is also attracting a lot of interest from criminals. Security firm Group IB says that hacking attempts against ICOs increased roughly tenfold during 2017. Group IB also contributed research to a report issued this week by Ernst & Young. 
The study found that of the approximately $3.7 billion raised in ICOs so far, about $400 million of it has simply been stolen. The typical theft involves phishing victims with bait that will induce them to send cryptocurrency to a wallet controlled by the criminals. Once it's there, it's gone, and a lot is going, about 10% of total investment. Indeed, cryptocurrency seems to attract criminals to its techno-libertarian garden the way carrion draws flies. Security researchers with Risk IQ took a look at 20 of the most popular legitimate app stores. You'll recognize most of them. They include the Apple App Store, Google Play, Same APK, and APK PLZ, and what Risk IQ found was disconcerting. Even in monitored and curated stores, of the over 1,800 apps the researchers inspected, 661 of them were blacklisted Bitcoin apps. Google Play hosted the most, some 272 malicious Bitcoin apps. Cryptocurrency is not only stolen directly, but it's also a popular means of getting ransomware victims to pay the extortion. The Sands Institute has been looking at this section of the criminal-to-criminal market. They found one ransomware-as-a-service offering that's ridiculously user-friendly and run on a royalty model. All you, the aspiring criminal, need do is specify the Bitcoin address to which you want the ransom delivered, and then select the amount of ransom you wish to demand, between a hundredth Bitcoin and one Bitcoin, and in a matter of seconds you get a malicious PE file you can turn loose on your victims. What do the proprietors of the service get? 10% of whatever ransom their customers collect. It appears to be either a proof-of-concept service or perhaps one that's still under development. One hopes, of course, that the criminal participants in this market will spend a lot of time and energy busily attempting to defraud one another, but the criminal-to-criminal market continues to display growing sophistication. Bell Canada disclosed a data breach affecting about 100,000 customers. The data lost were customer names and email addresses. Bell Canada says no credit card numbers or other sensitive information was taken, Nonetheless, the matter has been referred to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who are investigating. Earlier this week, another Canadian organization, Ontario Transit Operators Metrolinx, disclosed that it was hacked by North Korean hackers. The disclosure was light on details. Beyond saying that customer privacy and safety were not compromised, the transit provider cited security reasons for saying little beyond that. But sparse as details were, they were very specific in their attribution. Whatever was done, it was the North Koreans who done it. This hasn't played particularly well with the security sector. Observers would like to see evidence that fingered Pyongyang. The recent discovery of records for sale online from India's Athar database has caught the attention of security researchers. One of those researchers is Malcolm Harkins, Chief Security and Trust Officer at Silance. He joins us with his take on the breach. Well, you know, there's still a lot under investigation and reports are saying that police are investigating and other agencies within within India. But as far as what's been reported, there was access given to reporters who were apparently able to buy personal information for India citizens that apparently came from that national ID system for hundreds of rupees, so small dollar amounts, and therefore potentially exposing it. The the full nature of um, what exactly occurred still will probably have another several weeks or potentially even months to fully ascertain. But at this point, it's clear to say that information that is contained in that database, people's names, address, uh, perhaps phone numbers, emails, was able to be uh, purchased and so therefore exposed. And is there any uh, idea what the scale is of this? How many people's uh, information is available uh, throughout that nation? As, as I understand it, that system has been in use now for almost eight years. It started in 2009 as a voluntary uh, system again, meant to prevent fraud mm-hmm. and improve the identification of Indian citizens um, for a variety of purposes. And uh, last uh, reported that I've seen is uh, greater than 1 million or 1 billion, 1.2 billion uh, citizens of India, give or take a little bit, have their personal data and biometric data in the system. 
With the part that this database plays um, in their society for security, how do you see this playing out? What, what, are, what do you suppose the folks there are in for? You know, it, it will be interesting to see how it fully evolves and whether or not biometric data ends up having been potentially compromised versus just other sets of information. I think if it is anything like we've seen with the Equifax breach, or other breaches that we've seen in the US and in Europe, you can expect potential identity theft. You can expect fraud type items. You could expect that that information uh, could be used not necessarily for harming the individual. So let's just say Malcolm's uh, identity was uh, compromised it could be used in a way that could potentially harm me, but it could also be used to represent Malcolm. And so if I assume somebody else's identity, I could use that for a variety of purposes. One would be the obvious, you know, getting a credit card fraud, that type of stuff. You could use it for healthcare purposes. I'll pretend to be Malcolm and go get his medicine, go use his doctor's appointments, that type of stuff. You could also use it and say, who is Malcolm associated with? And if I have Malcolm's identity, can I pretend to be Malcolm to go after a different target? And so use the potential compromise of my identity to go after somebody else that I might be associated with or close to that's a more higher valued target because Malcolm might be associated with a senior executive in a company. Malcolm might be associated with you know, somebody in a particular research field. Mm-hmm. It, it all depends upon what the motivation is and the ways in which you could leverage the identities that you've compromised for whatever means or mechanisms that you might have as an attacker. That's Malcolm Harkins from Silence. At Davos, British Prime Minister May doubles down on her crypto-skeptic position in the crypto wars. She wants technology companies to, as she puts it, live up to their social responsibilities. Human trafficking, child abuse, terror, and extremism, she said, are being enabled by social media and messaging platforms that give malefactors a safe place to roost. She said, quote, Companies simply cannot stand by while their platforms are used to facilitate child abuse, modern slavery, or spreading of terrorist or extremist content, end quote. Prime Minister May named security messaging app Telegram as a principal offender. She'd like to see more cooperation out of them. Olympic-related hacking didn't end with the first doxing wave earlier this month. Fancy Bear has released documents stolen from the International Luge Federation. The hackers claim the documents reveal doping violations. Fancy Bear, generally identified with Russia's GRU military intelligence organization, has been upset over the International Olympic Committee's sanctioning of the Russian team. Finally, The Intercept notes with displeasure that the U.S. National Security Agency has changed the mission and values statement on its public website. NSA told the publication that they'd simply updated the website and not made any real changes to their values, but The Intercept isn't buying it. We've taken a look at both the new and old versions, and we have to admit that the changes look mostly verbal to us. The values of honesty and transparency that were in the old versions still seem to be there, albeit in a different form. So we're going with website update and not nefarious retreat from high ethical standards. But value statements raise interesting questions. What's the value of a value statement? On the one hand, public statements of some sort of code can seem to have good effect. One sees this sometimes in military organizations, for example. But on the other hand, they can also be so much marketing argle-bargle. One of the most famously high-minded corporate value statements of the last few decades belonged to Enron. Talk amongst yourselves. As our sponsors at E8 Security can tell you, there's no topic more talked about in the security space than artificial intelligence. Unless, maybe, it's machine learning. But it's not always easy to know what these could mean for you. So go to e8security.com slash cyberwire and see what AI and machine learning can do for your organization's security. 
In brief, it's not a panacea, not a cure-all, but rather an indispensable approach to getting the most out of your scarce, valuable, and expensive human security analysts. Let the machines handle the vast amounts of data. If you need to scale your security capability, AI and machine learning are the technologies that can help you do that. So visit e8security.com slash cyberwire and see how they can help you address your security challenges today. Follow the behavior, find the threat. And we thank E8 for sponsoring our show. And I'm pleased to be joined once again by David DeFore. He's the Senior Director of Engineering and Cybersecurity at WebRoot. David, welcome back. Um, here we are a couple weeks into 2018. Uh, what's on your radar for this year? Well, you know, uh, cybersecurity, of course. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of things are going to probably carry over from last year, and and you know, we'll see some things we've maybe been talking about for a while actually start to happen um, this year. Uh, and, and top of mind for me, David, is ransomware. Um, if if you know people have heard you and I talk in the past, they, everyone knows that's one of my favorite business models for uh, cyber criminals. And, and I see that growing just simply because the, the business model is a good one. I see lots of, uh, of new strains coming out. You know, 2010, we, we saw the first variant um, or the first instance of that. Uh, you know, by the end of this year, we're well over 500 different strains, not just polymorphed versions, but actual strains of, of ransomware. So I continue to see that to grow because it's a great way for cyber criminals to make money. Do you think there are any areas where people aren't uh, paying the attention that they should to particular things? Yes. And, and you know, we just started the year. And so I'm going to I'm going to look into my crystal ball back into uh, December where um, I, I was going to really talk about how we're going to start seeing some actual physical plants and facilities be affected uh, by cyber criminals. And, and if you look uh, around mid-December, um, last year, there was, in fact, a plant closure. Don't want to give out names or or exact locations. But if you go, uh, Google cyber attack uh, plant closure, you'll actually see where um, some cyber criminals have, are, are beginning to really affect and find very effective ways to take advantage of infrastructure and, and shut infrastructure down, physical infrastructure. So to me, I think we're going to start seeing a, a lot of that occurring um, both this year and in, into the future. And so for, for the day-to-day, for those of us who are uh, just l- trying to protect ourselves, keep our computers safe, uh, any new advice? Is it uh, just keep at it from last year, or uh, do, we have to, uh, do we have to change our tactics? Well, uh, and so uh, the advice a, a lot of times is the same. As, as Again, as if anyone's ever heard me talk with you, David, back up your data. That's the number one way to protect yourself. But I, I guess I would submit to people – Assume things are going to get hacked when you get those, you know, maybe over the holidays, you got some new electronic device that tracks your your walking or, you know, just just assume something is going to get hacked and don't enter information into it that you wouldn't be comfortable sharing with the public. That That's really the advice I would say. Just be vigilant and aware. All right. David DeFord, thanks for joining us. I thank you for having me, David. And that's the CyberWire. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially to our sustaining sponsor, Silence. To find out how Silence can help protect you through the use of artificial intelligence, visit Silance.com. And thanks to our supporting sponsor, E8 Security. Follow the behavior, find the threat. Visit E8Security.com to learn more. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. Our show is produced by Pratt Street Media with editor John Petrick, social media editor Jennifer Ivan, technical editor Chris Russell, executive editor Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.